Well, good morning and welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Round 2 Early Learning Hub Technical Assistance Webinar. My name is Heidi McGowan and it's great to join you again this morning to talk about the Early Learning Hub Round 2 uh, Technical Assistance. Today we're talking about building a strong pre-K through third grade connection. And I'm joined here with Brett Walker in the studio at the Early Learning Division. And on behalf of the Early Learning Council, we thank you for joining us and hope that this information is helpful and provides valuable information that supports you in your Early Learning Hub application efforts. So before we get started, I'd just like to orient you again to the webinar logistics. We'll do a quick review here. Ask that you, you mute your phone. All phones are muted from our end, but ask that you mute your, you mute your phone in the event that we've missed anyone. And on the right-hand side of your screen or on the top of your screen should be a chat box. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask of Brett, um, feel free to send those in at any time and we'll try to incorporate them as we go, but we also have set aside some time at the end of the webinar to respond to any questions that you might have. This webinar will be recorded today and available on the OregonEarlyLearning.com website by the end of the week. And you should be able to find the previous webinars on that website as well. So let's review our agenda today. Let's see. We'll do a brief hub overview. Uh, then we'll hear a presentation from Brett about the pre-K through third grade connection and why they're important for your early learning hub application. We'll then take time for questions before we close with a review of the upcoming webinars and the dates and times. Before we get to the webinar dates and times, I just want to call out that we have one slight change in the webinar on, on um, March 31st, Monday, March 31st. Uh, we will be holding that from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. rather than 12 to 1. So just want to note that in case any of you drop off during the call. Uh, the webinar will be on March 31st. It's um, our health our, our Connection with Healthcare webinar from 12.30 to 1.30. So let's jump in. I always like to keep the goals of the Early Learning Council front and center in any of the work that we're doing. So the, the Early Learning Council goals and the goals in front of us are that children are ready for su success when they arrive in kindergarten, that children are raised in stable and attached families, and that services are integrated and aligned into one early learning system focused on results. So what is an early learning hub? It's a self-organized, community-based, coordinating body created to provide a system approach to early childhood education, working to improve efficiency and outcomes for our youngest children. We know that early learning hubs currently are doing this and are building upon existing community resources and assets, are asking tough questions about what can be done differently to get better results and outcomes, especially for children who are at risk. Communities have the option of defining their own strategies and service areas to achieve these outcomes. And just to note that this is the first time in Oregon that early learning hubs are bringing together public schools, early learning providers, healthcare, social service providers, the private sector around shared outcomes, common shared outcomes. So I'll go ahead and turn this over to Brett Walker here who's going to share with us about how to build a strong pre-K through third grade connection. Brett? Thanks, Heidi. We know that one of the most important cross-sector uh, collaborations in, in the work that early learning hubs will be doing will be between uh, K-12 systems and providers of early learning services in their communities. So we're going to be spending the next 45 minutes or so focusing on what that looks like and what are some of the effective practices that are associated with building a strong connection uh, between, uh, between pre-K and, and the K through three system. This is an area um, that is gaining a lot of momentum and attention nationally and, and as well right here in Oregon. Uh, before we get started, I do want to point out and, and say that we have a few examples of um, work in this area right here in Oregon uh, that, that are where there's strong pre-K through third grade connections are being established and um, some really exciting and innovative local practices are in place. We're not going to talk about those examples today and the reason for that is, is that many of you know we currently have a request for applications open for our Early Learning Kindergarten Readiness Partnership and Innovation Program and um, 
as, throughout that open RFA period, we want to make sure to stay away from talking about, you know, real specific examples here in Oregon. But for those of you who may be involved in those projects, um, we, we are aware of the good work that's happening and, and um, you know, just want to let you know that there's, there's a, a, a reason why we're not going to be sharing those specific practices today, uh, but instead looking at promising practices sort of more generally. So I want to start with real big picture. Um, what you're looking at here is a graphic from uh, a, a document produced by the Oregon Education Investment Board, or OEIB, and one of their central missions in terms of uh, achieving the governor's vision for, that 40% uh, of all Oregonians will uh, have a bachelor's degree or higher, 40% will have uh, a, an associate's degree or some type of equivalent professional training, and 20% will graduate high school. The 40-40-20 the vision by 2025 is creating a more seamless education experience for children. Um, traditionally, educational experiences for children have been sort of siloed into uh, developmental periods or, or age ranges. So we could look at, you know, the zero to five age range as one silo, uh, K through five as another silo, middle school, high school, college, et cetera. What we're really trying to do in the state is um, create a more seamless process for all children through, through different systems and different uh, moments in time. And, and really what we're concerned with primarily here are the, are, are the first two moments in time that you see on this chart. Um, and that's, you know, ensuring that children are ready for school and that they are reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Um, and, and that reading on grade level by the end of third grade is so important for predicting children's future academic success. And what's really critical here when we think about the work of connecting pre-K with K through three is that it's not looking at these two outcomes as being separate, but rather Parts, uh, parts of the same continuum, really. One of the things that we want to start with today and, and spend a little bit of time focusing on is the Oregon Kindergarten Assessment. And we're doing that because the, the new Oregon Kindergarten Assessment is uh, a really valuable tool for connecting early learning in K through 3. Um, one of the things that, you know, one of the big discussions that's happening about the kindergarten assessment is what does this tell us about kids? Um, and certainly what this tells us about what children know and can do when they enter kindergarten is, is critically important. One of the things that we really want to promote and, and help folks understand is that the kindergarten assessment, while it provides very valuable information about children, it's also a really valuable tool for for adults, and it's a, it's a valuable tool for adults in terms of thinking about how do we work together more effectively to support all children in our community. I know that many of you are really familiar with what the kindergarten assessment is. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes making sure that we're all on the same page about this. And I want to start by uh, just touching on the, the different segments of the kindergarten assessment. The kindergarten assessment assesses um, three separate domains, early literacy, early math, and approaches to learning. Early literacy and early math are direct assessments, so that means a, a teacher or, or another trained adult in the school is actually sitting down with the child and helping them uh, work through the assessment measure. And, and the approaches to learning is actually an observational assessment that takes place in the context of classroom instruction and is based on teacher observation of children's behaviors and interactions in the classroom. Um, so the early literacy measure focuses on a couple key skills, letter name fluency and letter sound fluency. So children are asked to identify um, as many letters as possible out of 100 for letter names and 110 for letter sounds in one minute. Um, they may see multiple letters, the same. Uh, they, they may see the same letter multiple times. They may see uh, versions of, of the same letter in lowercase and uppercase. Uh, what this is not is simply reciting letters of the alphabet. This is looking at, at letters essentially on a chart. Um, and, and what's important here to understand is that there, they are um, that the scores that you see are out of 100. It's not out of the 26 letters out of the alphabet. So when you see a score of, say, you know, children in a certain school district averaged 20 letter names on this uh, segment of the assessment, what that tells you is that 
on average, children were able to identify correctly 20 letter names out of 100 in one minute. Uh, one of the questions and concerns that's been raised about the kindergarten assessment is whether or not it's appropriate to have children who are five years old participating in a timed measure. Uh, the early literacy measures are the only ones on the assessment that are timed, and they're, they're timed for one minute, and teachers and, and other adults in the school who are administering the assessment are trained so that children should not be told that they're being timed, should not be aware of the time, and should be allowed to come to a natural stopping point. So we really tried to design this with uh, keeping that kind of low stress, low key uh, approach for children in mind. I think when people hear, you know, timed assessment, what they think of is, you know, rows of children head down for four hours taking the SAT or something like that. And this is, this is really not at all what that is. The early math measure looks at some basic numbers and operations, uh, addition, subtraction, counting, patterns, things like that. And basically the way this one works is children are shown 16 uh, assessment items. It's actually two practice items and then 16 assessment items. And they are asked to point to the answer that they believe is correct on a, on a piece of paper um, or on a chart. Um, it, it's, uh, it's basically multiple choice, one out of three. So one of the questions that's come up about this one is it's not appropriate for children to be taking a paper and pencil test. Um, and that's not what this is. Um, at no point in the early math or early literacy measures are children, you know, using a pencil and writing anything on paper. Um, it's, it's only the assessor that would do that. And then the approaches to learning, again, takes place in the context of the classroom. It's based on a scale called the Child Behavior Rating Scale, which rates children um, in 15 areas of uh, behavior and interpersonal skills and, and, and interaction, and really it, what it's looking at is two subdomains. One is the self-regulation subdomain, and the other is interpersonal skills. And what research is telling us is that, in particular, the self-regulation subdomain is particularly predictive of children's future academic success. So that's one that we really want to, uh, to keep an eye on. Um, so children are rated on a scale from one to five, with one being never demonstrates the specific behavior, five being always demonstrates the specific behavior. And the behaviors that, that they're looking at are things like completes, completes tasks successfully or you know, cooperates with classmates or things along those lines. So the, the types of positive classroom behaviors that, um, that we know lead to academic success. Um, so what's really important here when you're looking at the data um, for your community as you're preparing your, your hub application is to think about where the gaps exist, particularly between subgroups of students or between schools or, and school districts and, and zip codes. So looking at where gaps may exist ge uh, geographically. And then also thinking about what, what are the types of um, practices and strategies and activities uh, and approaches that will help families, that will help uh, child care and early learning providers, uh, and, and build capacity across the community to be able to prepare children uh, to be ready to be successful in kindergarten, uh, looking at these uh, specific skill areas. And, and what I do want to say right there, particularly in relation to early literacy, because this one's gotten so much attention, is that in no way are we promoting a narrow approach to early literacy in which um, communities are focusing solely on making sure children know letter names and letter sounds. This is an indicator of children's early literacy skills. It is not the only important early literacy skill that children need to have, and the types of early literacy programs, initiatives, supports, and strategies that we are supporting and promoting and you know, want to see taking place across the state are those that take a very comprehensive approach to early literacy. One of the things that's really exciting about the kindergarten assessment is that we are already seeing some communities starting to use this data um, in ways that allow them to make uh, more meaningful connections between the early learning community and, and K-12. through 
Yeah. One of those examples is, is in Gladstone. So if we have anybody from Gladstone on the call today, you know, go ahead and, and, and pat yourself on the back. I've been in touch with some people in Gladstone. Um, and, and what they're doing is they are looking at kindergarten assessment data um, in the context of a range of other data that they are already collecting um, about the types of experiences that children have before they come into school. And they're also looking at it in the context of how does this match up with uh, data as children proceed through kindergarten? So they're really looking at the kindergarten assessment as this uh, sort of linchpin between the early learning experience and the kindergarten experience, which I think is really uh, creative and innovative. And um, they're also using it as a way to ask questions and to, to say, what else do we need to know about the children in our community who are getting ready to come into our schools? And, and what's so exciting about it is that it's, it's folks from the K-12 side and from the early learning side sitting down together and having these conversations and looking at the same data together um, and looking at, um, looking at children and families not from a standpoint of, well, the zero to five kids are your kids and the six through ten kids are our kids, but, you know, these are all of our children and, and, and all of our families in the same community, so we need to figure out how to work together. It's, it's really great work that's happening. Uh, we're seeing something similar in um, McMinnville in Yamhill County, which is one of uh, the first six early learning hubs. And they, they too are looking at kindergarten assessment data and asking questions about what does this mean for our children in terms of kindergarten readiness. One of the things that's great about what we're seeing in, in uh, Yamhill County is, is that they're, they really, um, they're really out in front in terms of making sure that healthcare partners, human service partners, um, home visiting programs are at the table and are looking at this data and saying, so what does this mean? and how do we all work together. So this is really um, a very comprehensive approach to, to using the kindergarten assessment data. And you know, not to say that what's happening in McMinnville and what's happening in Gladstone aren't happening in other places as well. Those are just two that we're aware of. Um, if you have a story about how your community is starting to use the kindergarten assessment data, um, we'd certainly love to hear it. A couple of our other uh, early learning hubs that are already in place are starting to use the kindergarten assessment data in some really um, exciting ways as well. So for example, in Lane County, um, Lane County is a really good example of um, looking at the, the kindergarten assessment performance targets, which are part of the accountability for hubs, and making sure that their strategic plan is aligned. So when they look at the outcome of all children ready for kindergarten, and the specific performance targets they have to set, they can map back and say, these are the strategies that we're putting in place to make sure that we're going to achieve our goals. And, and it's, it's very seamless, it's very aligned, and it's, it's really a nice piece of work. Out in Eastern Oregon, in Grant and Harney counties, which is called Frontier Early Learning Hub, um, they, they're doing some really interesting work around uh, preschool by mail. This is obviously an area that has very low population density. It's a large geographic area with very few uh, children who are uh, going to be coming into kindergarten in any given year. So instead of um, putting in place strategies that focus on getting children and families to come to the school for transition activities or, or you know, whatever the case may be, and not to say that they're not doing that, but what they're really focusing on here in terms of a kindergarten readiness strategy is making sure that they're getting uh, appropriate materials and, and curriculum to families right in their own homes so that um, families can essentially be providing a preschool level curriculum to their children um, without having to travel, you know, say 50 miles in one direction. Um, and the, the, uh, the data from the kindergarten assessment will help them measure progress over time to know whether or not that strategy is working. Um, and how it's working and for whom it's working. So these are just some examples of how certain communities are starting to use the kindergarten assessment data. We know we'll see a lot more of these over time. And, you know, a year from now having this conversation, I think we'll see some really exciting things in place. But it's great to see that these, uh, these things are already happening in the kindergarten assessment being used as, as a catalyst for local collaboration, which is what we're, we're really, you know, wanting to see. So 
moving forward and thinking a little bit more broadly about uh, linking pre-K through third grade, I wanted to share some information that I imagine some of you are already familiar with. Um, this is a graphic from a, from a document that I'll share with you in a moment that we'll spend a little bit of time with um, called the Framework for Planning, Implementing, and Evaluating Pre-K through Third Grade Approaches. This was developed uh, by, uh, by a couple folks, um, one out of the University of Washington and one out of uh, a National Evaluation Center, Christy Cowers and, and Julia Kaufman. And what they've done is they've essentially um, identified the specific areas of work that need to take place for an effective pre-K through third grade approach to be implemented and looked at what are some of the specific strategies that need to occur under those areas of work uh, and how do, you, how do you know if you're being successful and how do you make sure you have the right people at the table. Um, so you can see here on this graphic that this all starts with cross-sector work. So that's very much in line with what we're talking about with the early learning hubs uh, being the, the lead facilitator of collaboration, the lead convener uh, of uh, across sectors in a community. And as you, as you can see, as you go around this cycle, which really looks, uh, you know, a lot like a continuous improvement cycle, um, I think that, that what we see here in terms of educator effectiveness, instructional tools, learning environment, using data, and engaging families, these are, are not necessarily surprising areas. Okay, um, but the, you know, just to go a little bit deeper, these are these are the areas that, as you in your community develop um, a strategy and a plan and a path forward for really uh, linking pre-K through third grade in ways that are really meaningful, these are essentially the buckets of work or the areas of work where you will need to be. Um, digging in real deeply. And, and I want to take a moment um, just to show you what this framework looks like and then um, th what this framework document looks like. And we're going to share the link so that you can, you can dig into it. Um, and then we're going to spend a few minutes looking at some of these areas or buckets of work in, in a little bit more detail. So if you'll hold just a minute, Brett's going to call up the document that is the, the framework um, that I think you're referring to is the graphic or the framework? Yes. Okay. This should be a, 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 a framework that's going to surface on your screen that will say cross-sector work at the top of it. So let us know if you have any problems seeing this. So what you can see here is this is this is one of the buckets of work that they've identified. And the first bucket of work that needs to happen is what they call cross-sector work or cross-sector collaboration. And over here on the left-hand side, you can see that they've identified um, the high-level strategies that you need to be thinking about. And then in the next column over where it says example implementation indicators, that gives you a really good idea about what are the concrete things that we need to be doing. Um, so the first one you see here is establish a board, committee, or other entity with explicit responsibility for guiding um, and, de and making decisions about pre-K through third grade efforts. So if you look around your community and are at a point where you're saying, well, we don't know who would lead this work, that's the first step is to bring different, you know, different people to the table in, in a way that is collaborative and in a way that is um, reflective of, of the different uh, people and, and communities within the larger community. The next column over gives you an example and, and some ideas about what different people with different roles should be doing as part of each strategy. And then some ways to evaluate and, and self-assess your progress as you go. So this is really a rich, valuable tool, um, and I would really encourage you all to use it. Um, we're not going to spend any more time in the tool right now, but later in the webinar we'll be sharing the link with you so that you could go out and get this if you're not familiar with it. And now I'm going to bring us back into our, our presentation. So in terms of collaboration or cross-sector work, these are some of 
the, the promising practices that get called out in this framework document. So things like shared decision making, um, you know, for those of you who are involved in the webinar that we did a couple weeks ago on equity and family engagement, when thinking about shared decision making, um, there's a lot of overlap here between what we talked about in that webinar in terms of making sure that, that the right people are at the table, that, it's, that you're not just talking about high-level decision makers and policy makers and, and the executive level folks, but that you're really bringing in families um, and, and asking people from the community, you know, what does this look like to you and how can you help us create a shared vision for, for a pre-K through K-3 approach here in our community that's going to work for us. And another one that I, that I think is really important is this idea about shared language about student learning. Um, early learning providers and pre-K educators have a different way of talking about student learning and development than, than what we see in elementary schools. And it's not that one approach or the other is right. It's just that when, when different groups come together to talk about the same students, um, it's important that they be on the same page and they know what, what they mean when, they, when, when you're using specific terminology. So being intentional about that and spending some time on that is, is actually really important. And along those lines, um, shared professional development for, uh, for early learning providers and early elementary educators is critical. Um, if we're going to get you know, people on the same page, people working together, um, there has to be time and opportunity for people to be in the room together in a professional learning context. And along the lines of professional learning communities, one of the things that's so cool that this um, framework talks about is professional learning communities, both vertically and horizontally. And what they mean by that is, um, you know, a, a horizontal professional learning community would, would be, for example, um, the third grade teachers get together and look at student data and have opportunities for collaborative planning and, and things of that nature. And a vertical professional learning community would incorporate um, uh, teachers and educators at, at different levels. So bringing pre-K, kindergarten, first, second, third grade all together to talk about the same children um, over time. And, and that's, I think that's a really exciting and innovative approach. This is a tool to think about the level and depth and breadth of your collaborative efforts. Um, and I think that this is something that, that you can use both for the purposes of thinking about uh, aligned pre-K through third grade approaches, but also your work in terms of bringing partners together around your early learning hub uh, development process more broadly. And what this does is it, it, is it looks at three different types of, of um, collective work, coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. And it puts those three things on a continuum from informal to a more formalized partnership. And uh, in each one of the rows, you can see different levels of, of intensity, essentially, um, for different areas of the work. And I think that what, um, you know, if you look at what is in the right-hand column under formalized partnership, these are the types of things that we're talking about and, and um, pointing towards when we look at early learning, what a, what a successful early learning hub looks like in general, but also, you know, more specifically, what's going to make a, an approach to pre-K through third grade um, really successful. The, the successful examples and the effective examples that I'm aware of um, are really more about long-term formalized collaboration as opposed to kind of ad hoc and, and one-off coordination or um, short-term cooperative agree uh, working agreements. This is really a long-term um, investment in changing the way we, we work together. So jumping back into some, some more promising practices from uh, the, the framework doc that, we're, that we've been looking at, um, these are some practices that relate to instruction and classroom environment. Uh, so things like aligning standards and learning progressions. So that's really important um, when you think about um, you know, children 
having one specific sort of set of curriculum that that ends at the end of their four-year-old pre-K year, and then they're starting in on something new in kindergarten and maybe something new again in first grade and so on. Um, what this is saying is that everything from three years old through eight years old should really be aligned and um, kind of flow very nicely together. And, and along those lines, having common and appropriate instructional practices, um, using student data to inform instruction and decision making I think is really important. And, and this idea of an assessment loop across programs and buildings, so that's really about sharing information um, about how children are doing over time. So that's one of the things, you know, going back to the Gladstone example, that's one of the things that, that, that they're starting to do. Um, with the kindergarten assessment data, but obviously that's not the only data set that we want to be looking at. And I think that one of the things that's really important in terms of sharing data and creating this ongoing assessment loop is uh, the process of establishing trust. So that you know kind of goes back to the slide before with collaboration, formalized collaboration being kind of a high risk, uh, high trust activity. This is going to take some time. If you look at the framework document that we shared a few minutes ago, um, creating an assessment loop is not the first thing you're going to do. It's part of the progression with, with where you want to get to, but before that can happen, um, trust needs to be established, relationships need to be built, the structures need to be put in place to say this is our, our, our collaborative working time and space and how we're going to work together. Um, and, you know, hopefully over time and hopefully over not too much time, you'll get to the point where people feel comfortable sharing data and talking about data and, and figuring out, so how do, we, how do we all work together? But it may not be, you know, step one in your process. Family engagement is, is really one of the critical components to developing an effective uh, pre-K through third grade approach. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, families having voice in establishing the, the vision for what the approach looks like in your community and being involved in the ongoing decision making is absolutely critical. Um, engagement is embraced as a shared responsibility. This is something that we, again, we talked about a couple weeks ago. And um, what this is really getting at is that, you know, I think it's, it's, it's fairly easy for people to buy into and agree to the idea that uh, parents are their children's first teacher and that parents have a very important role to play in children's learning and development. Uh, where we want to get to is that providers of early learning services and schools uh, have a role and a role to play and a responsibility in helping support families to do that. Because while there are many families for whom that uh, that process of supporting their child's development and learning comes naturally, there there are other families for whom that's that's not natural, and and they need help um, in figuring out what are the best strategies and how do how do we build on the existing assets of a given family to be able to help them support their child's learning and development more effectively. Two-way communication, and uh, this is one that, that I'm really a big fan of, is data is shared appropriately with families. Um, this, to me, is, is one of the really sort of next generations of family engagement, um, sharing data with families in a way that helps them understand how children are learning and developing and um, supports them to support learning and development at home is really critical. Uh, I think that to some extent in, in education, we have a, a culture, and when I say we, I'm talking we broadly in the education world, have a culture of, of not wanting data to be transparent because we are uh, you know, concerned about what some of the repercussions of that might be. If we're going to effectively engage families as partners, and if we are going to get the outcomes for kids that we need to get, this is a critical piece of the puzzle, sharing data, being transparent about the data, and, and helping people understand what it means and what to do with it. Okay, so one other set of promising practices for uh, effective pre-K through third grade approaches that, that I wanted to discuss is, is focusing on early literacy. This is a big 
and, and critical area of focus for us in the state of Oregon right now will be over the course of the next several years. Late last year, uh, in October 2013, um, the National Governor, the National Governors Association, put out a, a report on uh, that's essentially a guide to early learning, and it identifies these five areas as key action areas, both at the state level and at the local level. So, you know, you can see that expanding access to high quality childcare, engaging uh, engaging parents professional development and continuous improvement and accountability. This is all very much in line with what we're trying to accomplish with the early learning hub model, as well as what we're trying to accomplish with uh, pre-K through third grade approaches. I would really encourage you to spend some time uh, with this report. This is really a valuable resource and one that we are looking to, um, you know, to help us guide some of the things that we want to accomplish with early literacy across the state. One of the things that's important to keep in mind when planning and preparing um, your pre-K through third grade approach is what are the different types of outcomes we might look at. So the way that I think about this is short-term, intermediate, and long-term outcomes. So short-term outcomes may look like process-oriented and relationship-oriented outcomes. This is really about how are we acting differently together. And how are we strengthening trust? How are we strengthening collaboration and communication? And um, what's, you know, essentially what's different about what we're doing? And what, what I mean by that is that you can look at really concrete examples. So um, that could look like repurposing some professional development time to make sure that uh, providers of early learning services and K-3 teachers have the time that they need for shared professional development and professional learning community. Um, it could also look at um, making sure that people who have not previously been involved in vision setting and decision making are now at the table. Um, you know, really concrete actions that can be pointed to to say, this is how we're doing business differently in our community now. Kindergarten readiness, uh, as, assessed, as measured by the kindergarten assessment, is a really critical um, intermediate outcome. Um, I think that it's, it's maybe unrealistic to say, well, we now have a pre-K through third grade approach, so therefore, you know, next fall, we're going to see massive jumps on, on our kindergarten assessment scores. I don't, I don't think it works that way. But I think that over time, and as you look at comprehensive um, kindergarten readiness strategies, uh, you will see improvement and you will see growth in, in the domains that are measured on the kindergarten assessment. And then long term, again, you know, this is, this is really all about pointing towards that third grade reading proficiency benchmark and, and of course, uh, reducing achievement gaps between groups of students. Wanted to just share a few resources with you. Um, again, this will be posted on our website, so you can go back and look at these URLs. Uh, the first one here is a, a community needs assessment that was developed by some folks at Portland State University, and I know it's been used in some communities throughout the state. Um, this is really a valuable resource for thinking about and, and finding out what does a, a pre-K through third grade approach look like in our community? I think a lot of people think if we just have a preschool that's attached to our elementary school, this is going to work and it's going to be great. And that may be the right approach, but it doesn't mean that it's the right approach for every community. So doing a needs assessment and figuring out what's important and, and, and what's valued in your community is really an important first step. The next two are the, uh, the Governor's Association Guide to Early Literacy that I mentioned, and then the framework for, for planning and uh, implementing and evaluating um, is really a, 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 such a valuable document. And then this last one is from the Harvard Family Research Project, and this is really about um, successful transition practices for moving uh, children and families from that four-year-old pre-K year into third grade. So, th so th that one is a little bit more targeted. 
And then here are a few more resources. These, this is a set of articles that the Foundation for Child Development put out recently. The first one, How Superintendents Lead Change, is all about the type of leadership that needs to be in place at the district level um, for an effective pre-K through third grade approach to be put into place. And, um, you know, as, as any of you know who work in, in K-12 um, or have worked with K-12, the extent to which uh, leadership is on board and out in front of a new initiative is really just so critical. So for those of you who are in those leadership roles, um, you know, I'd really encourage you to just to, to be the champions for this type of uh, initiative to take place in your community. The next one, is, is, this is actually also an article by Christy Cowers, who is one of the people who wrote the, the uh, planning and implementation framework. Uh, this is about full day kindergarten as um, as the central or one of the central components to uh, an aligned pre-K through third grade approach. And that's so valuable because as you all know, we're moving towards full day kindergarten implementation in this state. And um, I think this article does a really nice job of looking at how full day kindergarten and pre-K through third grade uh, approaches are, are, are aligned. And then the last one, what's the price tag? That's obviously looking at, so what are, what are the costs associated with this, the one-time cost, the ongoing cost? How much is this going to cost us to do this effectively? Um, and how do we look at different uh, you know, funding channels? It's not super in-depth, but it's a really good starting place as far as that goes. And for those, if you have questions about any of these resources or need help linking to them, please feel free to get in touch with me. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to help you. Uh, connect with these uh, resources. All right. Thank you, Brett. Thank you for that that broad uh, overview and, and sketch of, of some um, framework and strategies for connecting pre-K through third grade. I think we heard from Brett um, that really the goal is to create this seamless process for all children to to enter through our educational and early childhood systems um, with a seamless approach for, for our children, especially highlighting those markers of entering kindergarten with the measurement and outcome often measured at that third grade reading mark. So I appreciate you sharing the framework that you shared, the, some of the, the strategies that you highlighted, as well as highlighting some of the examples that are already happening here in Oregon. So just want to do a call and welcome any questions that uh, our listeners might have on the on the phone that you have of Brett um, before we close our webinar for the day. Uh, feel free to send those in over the chat box if you have anything you'd like to ask of Brett or if there are any um, additional inputs that you'd like to share. Happy to or, to welcome those into the dialogue here. So. We have a question here. So where can we find the slides used in these webinars on the Early Learning website, particularly want to be able to access the URLs and research? Thank you. Thank you, Patty, for that question. So this, wa this webinar will be recorded and placed on the Early Learning Division website. It should be on the front page. Uh, if it's not on the front page, it would be under the drop-down under the Early Learning Hubs. But I believe it should be on the front page. That's where the others have been posted when they're posted. So the webinar will include the slides, the PowerPoint slides that you're seeing in front of you, which will include the, what, the uh, URLs and the research that Brett called out. So the PowerPoint with the recording will be placed on the Early Learning Division website at, by the end of the week, and that's OregonEarlyLearning.com. Let us know if you're having any problem accessing that or if it's for some reason not there by the end of the week. We'll check from our end as well. So thank you for that question. And then another question is, are changes occurring with the kindergarten readiness assessment? Uh, the answer to that is that the, the kindergarten assessment will look very similar next year to what it looked like this year. Uh, there will be um, some adjustments to uh, the, the measure on Spanish syllable sounds, which we did not talk about um, earlier in today's webinar. But that, that was a, a measure that was given uh, specifically to um, Spanish-speaking English language learners this last year, it was done on a waiver basis, which means that, that schools had the opportunity to waive giving that assessment, um, which, is why that, which is why none of the data were included in the statewide release of data that happened earlier this year. Um, that one will look a little bit different next year. 
uh, the early literacy measures, early math, and approaches to learning will, will be the same. Thank you for that question. Uh, Follow-up question is, what assessment will be used statewide for third grade reading and math benchmarks? So the, the state is in the process of moving from the OAKS assessment to the, the Smarter Balance assessment, uh, which will, will happen next year. I, I am not an expert on the ins and outs of Smarter Balance, but I do know that the transition is taking place. Great. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Feel free to send in any other questions regarding any of these areas. I'm sure Brett will do his best to answer. And uh, in particular, the, the, the areas that um, would be most helpful for those of you who are filling out an early learning app hub application. Brett's been actively involved in the work with the round one early learning hub, so ha has some nice expertise he brings. All right, we'll go ahead and move forward, but welcome your questions as we go here. I'll, I'll pause because we just received another question. Thank you. So how are the K-3 personnel be, being involved in this process? We're facing difficulties in engaging district personnel in the conversation. Great question. Thank you. So, um, so that that is a really good question, um, and I think that you know, part of the um, part of the, part of the challenge and part of the opportunity with this work, both around creating a, a pre-K through third grade approach in a given community, and um, and and the work of the of the early learning hub in general, is is really around changing the nature of the relationship between schools and, and early learning. And um, I think the. The kindergarten assessment, as I mentioned earlier, gives us one opportunity to do that. Um, there are other opportunities as well. And one of those is, is the transition that we're making to full day kindergarten um, and what that's going to mean for how early learning providers and, and K-12 systems work together. Uh, one, of the, one of the other opportunities is, is funding, frankly. Um, we have a request for application for for uh, the uh, Early Learning Kindergarten Readiness Partnership and Innovation Grant uh, out right now. Oregon Community Foundation uh, is investing in uh, pre-K through third grade approaches right now. And um, I think it's an area that is gaining a lot of steam nationally and here in the state. Different communities are going to be at different levels of readiness to take on the, the type of in-depth and intense and long-term collaborative relationship building that is necessary for this to work. Um, but as we get more and more examples of what this looks like and, and what the outcomes are for children in the state, more and more districts are going to be on board with it, um, particularly as we see uh, the, the strong partnerships start to lead to uh, better results for kids, people are going to need to start paying attention. So it, it, it may not be something that happens um, right away in every community. And, and again, different communities are going to be at different levels of readiness. Um, but I think that the research is, is behind all of this is so powerful and so strong that when we start to build a, a, a larger body of evidence for what this work looks like in the state of Oregon, people are going to have to pay attention and, and it, it's going to require people to do things differently. Um, and that said, if there's anything that I can do um, in the short term to help facilitate some of the conversations and some of the communication and, and help um, bring some of the partners to the table. I'm happy to do that. We're obviously in this sort of tricky period with, you know, the early learning hub uh, applications underway, so that does put some constraints on how we at the state level can interact with those of you who are involved in putting together applications. But once we're through this phase, um, you know, standing offer to help anybody I can um, make the connections. Great. Thank you, Brett, and thank you for that question. Um, you have in front of you the, the slide with the upcoming webinars, 
And I just want to note that the March 31st webinar is 12.30 to 1.30. Can you change that on the fly? Oh. And we're going to see if Brett can actually change it on yeah, the fly I, here so I it makes it into the recording. But if not, uh, just want to call that out that the, the upcoming webinars that we have are um, next week on Thursday, March 27th, 10 to 11, and Monday, March 31st, um, from 12.30 to 1.30 want to highlight that and I think I saw another question come through. <laughs> well there's there's twelve thirty to one thirty. Brett's maneuvering here quickly on the fly, so thank you for your patience. So the question is can programs be encouraged to use other pre K evidence based curriculum other than creative curriculum? Uh to my knowledge we're not prescribing anything, any particular curriculum from that I'm aware of. Um, I think that what, you know, we'd like to see in terms of having an aligned pre-K through third grade approach is that the, the curriculum that's being used uh, and, and the, um, the approaches to instruction and classroom environment that are being used in pre-K are also aligned with what's happening in those early elementary years. So that's a great question that I'm hoping you'll raise next week on Thursday when we have our QRAS webinar. Um, Don Woods will be leading that, and there are several curriculum that are outlined in the QRAS that uh, have been called out as, as evidence-based curriculum. So uh, hold that question, raise that. Um, I think Brett's response um, gets, gives us an initial response, but would love to dive deeper into that with Don Woods. So thank you for that question. We have another comment, and this is um, something, an upcoming event. COSA is organizing a kindergarten summit on May 2nd in Salem. It may be a way to reach out to the K-3 through partners. So thank you for bringing that up. COSA is organizing a summit on May 2nd. Where can folks find out about that? I'm assuming that COSA has a website. They do, yes. And um, I know that on the main, there, that there's information about this on the main ODE website, and we're also actually working to get um, information linked on our website as well. Uh, this is something we've been involved uh, in, excuse me, helping to pull together, um, and I think it's going to be pretty exciting. That's going to be taking place here in Salem, <coughs> excuse me, at the Red Lion. And um, also, just along these same lines, at some point within the next few months following on the heels of this May 2nd conference, there will be another one-day conference that's specifically focused on pre-K through third grade. Um, we don't have dates, logistics yet, but as soon as we have that, we'll make sure to get that out to everybody. That's just something to keep on your radar. Great. So keep your eye open for uh, the upcoming event around on the same topic, pre-K through third grade. and. Um, share with your, your partners about the COSA event. Uh, that's a kindergarten summit on May 2nd here at the Red Lion in Salem. You can find out information on the COSA website as well as the Early Learning, the Oregon Department of Ed website, and hopefully soon on the Early Learning website. Thank you for raising that. That's, that's an excellent um, opportunity for partners to come to. Okay, so I'm just going to do one quick recap here. Upcoming webinars. Um, oh, it didn't quite get there. Um, for some reason, okay, we won't go there. <laughs> so next week, Thursday, March March uh, 27th, we'll, we're going to talk about the Quality Rating and Improvement System, the QRIS, and Don Woods will be presenting on that. A core component of the Early Learning Hub application uh, addresses the, the QRIS. And then on Monday, March 30, 31st, from 12.30 to 1.30, we'll be talking about the connection to healthcare and have a couple representatives from, the C from a couple CCOs in Oregon who are going to join Dana Harginani from the Oregon Health Authority to talk about how that's looking in early learning hubs. So that's Monday, March 31st. The time has been changed to 12.30 to 1.30, a half hour later. So I don't see any further questions, and so we'll go ahead and close for the day and would like to um, close one, we have the contact information here. Brett, if you have any follow-up questions, as well as Megan Irwin, thank you again for taking time today. We very much appreciate you taking time and, and um, look forward to talking with you next week on Thursday. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you, everyone.